time for communion. It's time to reunite with our Lord, to make our relationship together with Him number one, number one. And in order to do that, we need to realize how important and how special this communion is. Because what it, is, what it um, enhances and then what it instills in us is uh, revival. It, it refreshes a new start every single time we can come and commune with Him. It's a time to reevaluate. It's a time to focus. And it's a time to seek His face for His will. So I want to start with these scriptures and then I'll expound on them to just share what God is saying to us as the body of Christ, as a church, even the Holy Spirit in this season and in this time. In Matthew 26, 20 through 29, it says, When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now, as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, He who dips his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, You have said it. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take ye, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This is so powerful when you think about this. Because Jesus betrayed, I mean, Judas betrayed Jesus. But so did all the rest of the disciples. They, at one time or another, they all betrayed him. We all betrayed him. But this is a time of renewing. This is a time of refreshing. This is a time of restoring. So even though God knew Judas would, re, would betray him, he still invited him to the Last Supper. So he invited all of us to this time to commune with him. No matter what we did against him and his kingdom, he still invites us and tells us as many times, as often as you want, you can come. You can come and and commune with me. The only challenge between Judas and us is that we keep keep on coming. We're staying to receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Judas didn't stay. Judas left and didn't come back. Do you see how powerful it is for us to be able to do this? God opens up the door. He is the door to this year, to to, to your life, to, to your provision, to your healing. He's the door to everything that we need, even everlasting life. So we shouldn't take this opportunity lightly. We we should understand that it is a privilege and an honor not to walk away. 
but to continue to come back and to come back and to come back to the throne of mercy, to the throne of grace, to the throne of agape love for the remission. Did you hear that? The remission of sins. That means cancellation. Cancellation of all your sins. And the body, which is embodies all the promises of the word of God. That's the body of Christ. Why would any one of us want to walk away from that? That's why Jesus said it's better that he never be born than to have the opportunity to come to enter in to the body, to the blood of Jesus Christ and not walk away. So this is what we're going to do today. We're going to remember the power of this moment, this communion. And we're going to thank God for never giving up on us, never walking away from us, giving us this opportunity time and time again. By committing to him this year that we will not walk away. We will keep coming back to you because you are the door to our life. And we thank you for it. So it is a privilege and an opportunity now to eat with me as the body of Christ, the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And thank you. the body. opportunity to see a new year. How many of you are grateful Hallelujah. to see a new year? So we're, we're very thankful to God. As many of you may know, Ark of Safety's theme this year is I am the door in 2024. How many of you are grateful that Jesus is the door? Amen. He is the door. And I'm just going to take a just a message off of where Apostle is going with our, our theme this morning. But I do want to say on behalf of my husband and our children, our, our grandchildren, welcome to Ark of Safety. I'm glad to be in the new year with all of you today. I know that God has something in store for us in this new year. How many of you are just thankful that you ended 2023 by the grace of God and you're expecting God to do something new in 2024? Come on, you got to come expecting. I always say that if you don't come expecting, you're, you're walking in just being the same. And I didn't walk into 2024 the same. 
I said, Father, I'm coming to expect more in 2024. You know, our theme is, I am the door, Jesus Christ, what Apostle is talking about, God is the door. And if he is the door, he is every door to prosperity. He is every door to healing. He is every door to success. He is every door for mending of relationships. He is every door for fixing the things that you and I cannot fix in our lives. We got to know that. That tells me that everything that we may have struggled with, every situation we may have went, to, went through last year, Jesus Christ is the answer. He is the way. He is the only way. That's what, it, that's what it confirms to me. He is the way. And so today as we jump into our message, once again, we want to take that theme this year. We want to be encouraged by it. How many of you know we need some encouragement? Because thank you. Thank you for putting up the theme. Because I do know that coming into the new year, as much as some of us is believing that God is the door for everything in our lives. This year, just coming into the new year, many of us already have had struggles. Come on, somebody. Many of us already were challenged, and that's exactly what the devil wants to do. Set up challenges so we never ever see that God is the door, that he is the way. How many of you know that? If you don't know, let me tell you, the devil is going to work extra harder. He don't want you and I knowing that God is the only way. Scripture there says, John 10, 9, I am the door. Anyone who enters through me will be saved and will live forever. You got to enter. Come on, somebody. You got to enter. He said he is the door, but you got to enter. And we'll go in and out freely and find pasture, spiritual security. How many of you know that everything in our lives, if our spiritual life is not in line, nothing else will be in line? Nothing else will be in line. And it tells me here with God, with Jesus Christ being the door, there's spiritual security. And if I want everything, every area of my life to be lined up, I got to know who's the answer. I got to know who's the answer. Come on, I didn't come this morning to just say hi. I came this morning to break bread because I know I need it in my life. I came this morning to hear what God has in store. So we're going to jump right in. You saw there our theme. You saw the scripture for our church this morning. We're going to use that same theme and jump into our message here at Kapolei. We'll jump right into our objective this morning. It says, there are many doors of different shapes, sizes, and colors. And you've seen that on that pictures. There are many doors. How many of you know that your neighbor's door might be purple, one might be red, yours might be brown. Yours might be white. Right? There are many doors of different shapes, sizes, and colors. But once open, the inside of each door presents different experiences, results, and opportunities. How many of you know that? Besides we knowing that Jesus is the only way, let's look at it uh, this morning in the Word, that we live in this world that presents many doors of opportunities. And the different things that it presents gives us different experiences, different results. And you, on the po you own the power to receive and accept what is beyond the door or not. How many of you know that you own that power? Amen. Nobody can force you to enter the door. You own that power. When Jesus Christ went to the cross, he gave us back our willpower to make decisions on our own. That's the reason why we have a choice to accept him as King of kings and Lord of lords. That's the reason why we have a choice to serve him. He says, I am the way. But how many of you know that you got to know that he's the way? He ain't going to force you. You got to know that he is the way. Because when you know for yourself that Jesus is the way, how many of you know that there's no man on earth that can sway your decision for knowing that Jesus is the only way? Amen. Amen. Some doors can bring one success and prosperity. Others offer love and intimacy. While some are hidden intentions for hurt, bondage, and senseless acts of assault and violence. How many of you know there's so much doors in this world? You and ultimately you are the one who holds the willpower to open a door and walk through and receive what it presents. So in this world, I do want to say choose wisely. Amen, Amen church? You got to choose wisely. I'm jump right into the meat of the message. What causes one to open a door? Because we know that Jesus Christ is the main door. He is the way. But how many of you know, sometimes we open other doors in life. And it's okay when we have doors of opportunities because God's, God gives us up doors of opportunities. Many of the doors is according to the will of God for our lives. 
But there are, there are doors that sometimes we open that may not be from God. So knowing that He is the way, the only way, He is the door to uh, spiritual security. What causes you and I to open some doors in our lives, whether good or bad? I'd like to take you on the first one. Instruction causes us to open doors in our life. Instruction. What do I mean by instruction? We are told to open a door. How many of you know when you get home, you tell your kids, get out and open the door? That's instruction. Right? right? Your boss tells you, you got to go through that door. That's where you're going to work. That's instruction. Many of us know we got to wait through Costco's. There's somebody standing at the door checking our cards. That's instruction. Now to end, exit the door, you cannot just walk out. Somebody has to check the receipt. That's instruction. That's following instructions. So what causes us to open a door, to walk out of the door, just to go through the door, to know that that door is a path? Instruction. We look back at Abraham. And I think right before we went into uh, Christmas, right before we, we departed here to go and meet in our one service for our Christmas Eve service and our um, New Year's Eve service, we talked a little bit about Abraham. How many of you remember we talked a little bit about Abraham? Abraham was given an instruction. Abraham was instructed to take Isaac to where? Mount Moriah. And prepare him to be a sacrifice. Walking that path was not easy. But he obeyed and opened the door, church, to generational blessings for his family. And again, I want to say, and I don't want to jump into other scriptures because we went a lot through Abraham, but I do want to give, give it a brief um, scenario here with this key of instruction. Moses listened to the door, to listen to the instruction. And God spoke to him and said, you're going to take your son and you're going to take him up to Mount Moriah. He had to leave his people with on the bottom and he, and he left them there and said, only, only the lad and I will go up. Because he had to prepare for the sacrifice. And Isaac didn't know that at the time God was telling Abraham that Isaac would probably be the sacrifice. How many of you know walking down paths that God is instructing you to walk down is not easy sometimes? Right. This is the path and this is a door that Abraham was walking into that Abraham didn't realize what it would do for you and I today. Amen. How many of you know that? When Abraham decided to be obedient and follow instructions and walk that path to take his son to be a sacrifice, to be laid as a sacrifice, he didn't know it was opening doors that his seed, seed will be blessed. Amen. How many of you know that we are Abraham's seed, seed? Right. Yes. See, his father Abraham used to say his father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. How many of you remember that song? If you went to Sunday school and you were young. So let's just praise the Lord. I remember that song. We come out of seeds of Abraham. But Abraham had to follow instructions. And I do want to say, if you just take a look at that scenario of Abraham, it was an instruction that he was given to walk this path. This path represents the door. To walk through that door to do what God was calling him to do. Even if he didn't know that God was going to provide a ram caught in the thicket. We know that God is the door. We know ultimately he is the only way. Jesus is the way. But sometimes we face decisions in life and God is giving you and I instructions. And we don't see the end result. How many of you sometimes you want to see the end result? We got to see the bigger picture. Many of times in serving God, we cannot see That's the right. bigger picture. That's right. Almost all the time. Sure, scripture says, make the vision plain and clear so they that see it can, can read it and run with it. But let me tell you, the visionary that God has given to make the vision clear, sometimes they cannot see the whole vision at the time. And you know what they're saying? Father, I trust you. I trust you. Let me tell you, head of homes, that's going to be you. 
That should be you. For the head of your home, you got to learn to trust God because sometimes you may not see the bigger picture. I had a cousin I grew up with my entire life in, in, in another house of worship. She came up to me. We were talking last night. She said, pray for my kids. She said, shucks. They just, you know, they just doing all these things. And I said, but the seed was planted. Trust the That's seed was right. planted. Right. You trust that the seed was planted. Continue to encourage them. She said, shucks, I don't know what's happening with them. They're just doing their own thing. It's not how they were raised. I looked at her because she's a widow. Trying to run this race alone, raising her children and now soon to be her grandchildren. She said, I'm having a hard time. I said, don't you give up on Jesus because he didn't give up on you. You might not see the bigger picture. You might not even see the end result. But I looked at her and I said, hold on to Jesus. He's the only way. Don't let go of Jesus. He's the only way. Parents, you might not see the end result. You might not see your family serving God with you right now. Right now. They might not be serving God the way you want them to. Your, your spouse might not be serving God the way you want them to. But you got to hold on to Jesus. Because what the theme he gave for this house is, I am the door. And if he's telling me he's the door, he's telling me he is the way. He already made the way. He here. Everything that you're already questioning, every answer that you're searching for, he is the only way. You got to know to stay in the door. There's times we're indoors and we want to walk out. We want to walk out. It's like the kids, right? Our, our home where we live, because of our HOA rules, we cannot put up just like a, a fence right in front of our door, right? Or our driveway. Certain rules we got to follow. I don't agree with all the rules, but it is the rules and I chose to live there. So I got to follow the rules. I tell my kids, especially my granddaughter, she knows how to open the door. And I told him, you make sure that door is locked. Because at any time, she wants to find her way to the outside. Because she knows outside is water. She wants to play water. Outside is her bike. She wants to go sit on her bike. But she don't know that those things can be harmful to her. So I tell the kids, you make sure that door is locked. I especially made sure our, our security was up to par. So if they're not locking the door, I'm checking the door. I want to make sure she's in the house. And if that door ain't locked, I'm locking it from my phone. Because I want to make sure that door is locked at all times. Not just because she can get out, but at any times, people that we don't want to enter our home can enter the home. How many of you know we're talking about doors, but there's so many aspects, church, that we can, we can look at today. There's so many aspects. Abraham had to trust and he had to obey. And today you and I seen that that path that he took, that door that he walked into because of instruction and obedience, gave you and I a promise that we would be blessed. That our seed will be blessed. Amen? That our seed, how many of you want your seed to be blessed? I don't want to just be blessed and watch my seed just have nothing. I want, I want them to be blessed. So what is my, what is, what am I instructed to do by God? Train them up in the ways they should go and when they're old, they will never depart from it. Church, that's the answer. You want to know the answer? Giving them lots of Christmas gifts ain't the answer. Because a lot of times gifts, they will never remember what they have. But you give them Jesus, you're giving them eternal life, access to eternal life. That is the key, that is the way. My kids might not want to hear it all the time. I'm sorry if I'm coming, dropping heat from the beginning, but I'm listening to the voice of God and I'm trusting I'm going to trust His word because let me tell you, I'm not in your situation. I'm not in your finances. I'm not in your marriage. I'm not in your home. But you came this morning to hear from Him. So you pray for me that God's downloading a message just for you. If you came walking in that door this morning, trust God that He's going to deliver a message. So when you walk out, you not only know that he is the way, your entire life is lined up to the way. There is no other option. There is no compromise. I'm going to do it though this is the only way. Amen? We got to know that that's the only way. What causes one to open that door? Instruction. Instruction. What else causes doors to be open? What else causes one to open doors, rather good or bad? Let me tell you one. Curiosity. And we know the same curiosity kills a cat. 
Curiosity causes doors to be open. We want to see what others are talking about and experience it for ourselves. Hearing about it is not enough. We got to experience it. How many of you know that's what curiosity is about? Oh, I try myself. It's like me telling you, did you, did you, did you try the new um, 85 degree cafe by Safeway? And you go like this. Wow, what, what is it like? If you like bread. If you are a bread lover, you're going to love that cafe. Thor and I, we frequent that cafe. I, my husband didn't know that. Now he knows that. And I tell Thor this. Thor, you want to eat bread? Yeah, mom, we go. Don't tell nobody. I said, we go. Don't tell daddy to come here all the time, mom. He said, mom, it's our secret. He said, okay, so let's go get us some taro bread. I love bread. I love donuts. I blamed it on my dad. <laughs> because when we go to the mainland, we look for Krispy Kreme and we watch till the red light comes on. We don't just buy any Krispy Kreme. You gotta buy the Krispy Kreme when the red light comes on. Why? Because that's the hot, fresh donuts. When the red light is on in Krispy Kreme, it's melt in your mouth Krispy Kreme. If you're buying somebody's fundraiser, that's just Krispy Kreme. That's not the real Krispy Kreme. But if you go to Krispy Kreme and the red light is on, I always tell my husband, because he goes to Maui to work a lot, honey, make sure you give us some Krispy Kreme. When that red light is on, you stand in that line, and then you just walk the sugar off later. Curiosity. I can tell you these things, so you know what it makes you do? You go like this, the next time I'm there, I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna watch for the red light. I think, I think it might come on five o'clock in the morning or something like that, and maybe some five, six o'clock in the evening. See, I even know the times. But by me sharing with you the things that I like, you go like this, I just gotta try it. I gotta try it. I gotta try it. I'd like to take you to the book of Genesis chapter three. Because in this situation, curiosity changed all of mankind. Genesis chapter three, verse one. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a pleasant, or it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. And they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Let me stop right there. They made themselves coverings. We can go on and have a good debate in 2024 <laughs> about who ate it, who didn't eat it, and who said to eat it. But let's really look at the scripture again. It says here, the woman saw that the tree was good for food. The woman saw that the tree was good for food. And the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took of it. She gave it then to who? I didn't say stupid husband. 
I've seen some people saying stupid husband. She gave it to her husband. Now the debate always is, right, in marriage class or wherever we go, as the head of the home, where was he? Why was he just standing on the side? And then they like to say, but the woman gave it to the man. At the end of the day, women, who mostly thinks of what to serve your family for dinner? The woman. Because we're looking for what is most desirable for our home to eat. It's a pleasure for me to always think of the things my husband likes to eat. What is desirable to him. And I think of ways to cook the meals that he would want to eat. Because emotionally, we can find ourselves wanting to meet the needs and desires of our family. So as a woman, emotionally, she looked at the desires for her and her husband and said, ooh, that looks like something that's good to eat. How many of you know women? That's the reason why we gotta make sure our emotions are lined up with the will of God. That's good. That's good. Because not all the times the things that looks desirable is good for your family. Not all the, th the times the things that looks good taste good. Not all the times the things that is presented. One of the things that I wanna bring up here is the influence of social media. Because if you want to talk about curiosity, curiosity kills a cat is a great saying. Because what social media does, it made people curious. How many of you saw something on TikTok and you were like this? Oh, I gotta try it. I'm gonna order it. I know I'm not the only one. I want it to make me much butter, uh, much, I want to not butter mochi, but Mochi, I like mochi, um, strawberry mochi with uh, black beans inside. I also like it with cookie butter. So I was watching this girl on TikTok one day and she does all this great Hawaii food. And she said, New Year's is coming up. I can teach you how to make mochi. So I was like, perfect. I'm gonna learn how to make mochi because I'm just giving all my money away to this, the mochi guy. So I said, I learned how to make mochi. I went to the store, I bought me the mochi box, she said to buy. I got me potato flour. I asked Auntie Cat for some ideas. T Cat sent me some of her recipes. So I said, I can do this, I can make this. Let's just say at the end of everything, I tasted more potato flour than anything else. So far I was like, mommy, are you gonna make the mochi again? I said, son, we're just gonna buy the mochi. He said, Mommy, but you still have a box on the counter. I said, Son, I don't know what happened. He said, Did you follow the directions? I said, I don't know if, the, if they gave me the right directions. Because all I could taste in the fridge was potato flour. And I said, This is not for me. But what it does, what social media had opened up the world for, is to allow you and I to be curious. It came right into our homes, right on our beds, right on our living room couch, right in our cars, and it allows you and I to be curious of the things that people are talking about. You cannot tell me you don't know what I'm talking about. Right. Because how do you post? The post is what's on your mind. So you and I become curious on what's on everybody's mind. You and I become curious of what people were even responding to what is on that person's mind. So we look at their posts and we read all their responses because we become curious as to, I like to see what that person said. I like to see what this person said. I like to see where that person went. I mean, when my husband and I go to eat at certain places, we've never been there before. There's this one girl that I follow. She, she does reviews. So I go to her first and I look to see if she reviewed that place. And I say, honey, she reviewed the place. We should try it out. So what it did is it, it, it expanded our curiosity of the things in this world that we never ever had the opportunity to have right at our fingertips. It can be good and it can be bad. 
Now you look at what happened to Eve. She didn't have social media. She didn't have uh, TikTok influencers. She didn't even have Timu that you can get your scrubber for $19 instead of $69 from Macy's. My daughter moved into their own home. I said, Nanea, go on Timu. She said, Mom, you shop there. I said, you, you invited me. It says, Nanea is inviting you to download Timu. So I downloaded Timu. Now, now I'm shopping there. You told me you don't shop there. She goes, Mom, I deleted it a long time ago. There's bad things that's happening with Timu. They're taking people's money. I said, Nanea, you sent it to Mommy. So I'm just telling you, you can get your kitchen things there for 99 cents. Daiso, Daiso, Daiso. But these things have opened up so many doors of curiosity. How many of you know that? We are far more curious at what's out there than ever before. Our family was always travelers. We went to the mainland all the time. I like to say my grandmother, Apostle Jay's mom, my grandma Eto, was a mass master at reading maps. There was no way we could be lost with her. We would take our family sometimes four or five vehicles in a row. The, the drivers would meet the night before. She would make them highlight every road that we're going on. She knew every road. She could read every map. We were in the palm of safety in her hands because she was the master map reader. But if you didn't know how to read a map, how many of you know your family wouldn't even take the chance to travel? Because you didn't want to get lost. You weren't sure what was out there. Now you take a look at what's happening today. I would never dare travel without my parents before. Now it's my dad is like, do you guys know where you guys going? Don't worry, dad, I have Google Maps. Breaking down these things because curiosity allows us to experience way more things than we've ever experienced before. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. We are not afraid to stay in our safety comfort right zone because smartphone apps has allowed you and I to get out there and just explore many things that seemed so uncomfortable before. The serpent said to the woman, now not TikTok, the serpent, Satan himself that came in the form of a serpent, just by the words. See, if you're on your friend's page and they have a picture of a mountain, is it as effective to you if that mountain and then they just said something like, don't forget to try Chick-fil-A? Would that be effective to you? Unless they put a picture of Chick-fil-A and whatever good sauces they're putting in there and then they're like biting it as a reel and on a story. You gotta try this out. A picture of a mountain and just saying Chick-fil-A is good is not as good as the actual sandwich and somebody biting it and talking about it. Now you think about this, this was a serpent. Just the words of a serpent that came in and changed women, all mankind. Because of what was done, women had to be what? Labor, rest. All mankind changed. Man shall work. Sweat of their brothers. Women will experience labor. Why? Because they just heard the words of a serpent. Be careful what you hear. He who has your ears has your future. Be careful what you hear. This serpent made an influence on Eve. And because her emotions wasn't in line. And because... Adam stood on the side, and this is where we go back even to the men. You cannot just stand on the side and let your wife make every decision. Women, you cannot make decisions without consulting your spouses. Apostle Jay talks about that all the time to you and I. Make sure when a decision is made, you're consulting with each other. That's what you call accountability. Come on. 
That's accountability. When one is weak, one is strong. Her desires might not be according to God, but men, if you're not there to help her to make a decision, she's making it probably off of emotions and not making the right decision for your family. Had he been standing there, now let's talk about the truth. They could have easily talked about these things. Had she went back and told him, you know, it looks good from this. It looks good for this. He could have came and said, but that's not what God said. Man, if, men, if you're not hearing from God, you're not able to lead your family right. Women, if you're not lining up your emotions and your desires. Sometimes women in our pity party attitude, because we want to be pity party, can get you and I in trouble. I know that that's not popular today. I can see the way some of you are looking at me. That's okay. We're entering into a new year. God is good. He's making changes in our lives. Amen? Come on. You want a different year? You got to do things differently. You might find, you may have found today, that's the problem. I'm not consulting with my husband. We're not working these things. Men, you might find right now, you're not sitting with your wife and helping them make a decision that is best. This is what many of you men say. Just go ahead and do it. Just go ahead. Men, that's that's the problem in in. in in marriages today, you're telling your spouse, just go ahead and do it, honey. No, no, no. It was meant for the two of you to do it together, side by side. Not one in the front, not one in the back, side by side. You need to work together. Sometimes, men, we want to be laid back. We don't want to get into drama, happy wife, happy life. That's even a life on the pit of hell. We have a lot of problems today because the head, the man of the house has not taken his place. And the mom that's making emotional decisions, of course, wants to see her children happy. So she'll emotionally allow them to do things that is not right. And that's a lot of the problems we need to clean up today. We need to put the men, we need to put God as the head of the house. Men got to continue to stand up and rise up in the, in the house. Women, you got to know your role and your place in the house. So when we know that Jesus is the door, the only way, he, he is right he, he is everything we need. Not only we know that, but then our children know that. Amen, church? Amen. Because one day they're going to leave you. And you, you want to pray and make sure that exactly how you desire your life to be is exact. God, I hope I instilled whatever I could. I'm happy for my daughter. She has her own place. But at the same time, that's out of my covering and my protection. I cannot see. I cannot make those decisions. I can only pray that they're making wise decisions. Right. I can only pray that God is the head of that home. I can only pray, Father, that you allow grace, that you allow mercy, God, to fall upon their home. That God, as I stay faithful to you, be faithful to my daughter and her family. Please, God, I ask you to be faithful to them. Because once your kids leave you, once your family leave you, let me tell you. It's going to be scary. Many of you know that. Sometimes you want to say, I cannot wait till they leave. The moment they leave, you go like this. Oh, I wonder, oh God, I hope they're okay. God, I hope they're okay. Curiosity. Curiosity was meant, it's a good thing. Curiosity was meant to call God's people to action for him. That's what curiosity was meant, to call God's people for action. Not for them to be deceived and led astray. Everything we do should be for the kingdom. Yes. Oh, that's what's happening there. That's what's working there. I wonder if that can work in the house of God. Come on, church. Curiosity was meant for the kingdom of God. If they can do that there, and we, can, we know it's going to work here, it can work here. Let's see what we can do. Let's go find out about it. Let's learn about it. It is so important that we are curious, church, for the furtherance of the kingdom of God. Amen. For kingdom's purpose. Amen. Amen? Amen. The third door, the third, the third cause of why doors are open today in our lives is because of rebellion. The first was instruction, the second was curiosity, the third is rebellion. We open doors that we are told not to open. Because we feel we want to experience what's inside of those doors for ourselves. 
So no matter how many times your parents, your teachers, your counselors, your grandparents, your pastors can tell you, don't open that door. We want to experience ourselves so we rebel against the truth. We just want to be able to say that we know what's behind those doors. We want to be saved. We want to determine what is good for us. Even if the red lights are all flashing, warning, keep out, we still yet want to rebel at times and say, I'll like find out for myself. We don't care about the consequences and who it might affect. We want to live for the moment and enjoy it while we can. While we can. Jonah was a good example of disobedience and rebellion. Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He wasn't just leaving instruction. He wasn't just leaving his calling. He was now leaving the presence of the Lord. Church, if you don't get that, that scripture right there, if you're leaving the instruction of the Lord, you're leaving the presence of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I don't ever want to leave the presence of the Lord. I want to always abide under the shadow of the Almighty because if I'm under the shadow of the Almighty, there is safety, spiritual safety, spiritual security, what it talked about earlier. You don't want to leave the presence of the Lord. But if you're being rebellious and leaving the calling of God, leaving the instructions of God, you're leaving the presence of the Lord. Amen. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare. See, when you're out of line with God, you got to pay for things. When you're out of line with God, you got to pay more than God even wanted you to do. Because the favor of the Lord will buy you what money cannot. But when you're out of line with God, you got to lose, use the finances God has blessed for you and your family. And now your disobedience is causing you to pay your way through. Because the favor of God was removed from you when you took yourself out of the presence of God. He paid the fare and went down into it to go with them. Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. The storm at the sea in verse 4 it says, But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners, mariners were afraid and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship and he lay down and was fast asleep. Who sleeps in the middle of a storm? Somebody that is trying to cover up from knowing that they made a huge mistake. That's what the devil wants you and I to do. Lay down in isolation and depression in your bed. Don't want to talk to anybody because you know you made a mistake. You moved yourself out of the presence of God, so you isolate. You cause yourself to lay down and try to sleep. And all the time while you're trying to sleep, your mind is racing and you cannot sleep because you know you did something that God told you not to do. Don't ever tell me you're sleeping. Because when the Spirit of God has a calling of your life, let me tell you, you cannot sleep. I remember an apostle and pastor Jerry went to Morcerillo one year for New Year's. And my auntie and my uncle came to watch us because they would always come to watch and stay at the house with us when apostle and would leave for Morcerillo. And I was told that I couldn't go to my friend's New Year's party. I was so upset at my auntie. And she said, your mom said you cannot go. I was so upset at her, but I didn't want to disrespect her. So I laid down on the couch and I pretended to be sleeping. And she came in the living room and she's talking to me. I, I, I had my eyes closed. I didn't want to look at her. And then she went like this to me. I know you are. She said, because your leg is moving and shaking while you're pretending to be sleeping. So stop making like you're sleeping because I know you are. Your mom said no and no is no. You want to know, sometimes we do that.
I laid down. I was the only bitter one grumbling to myself, talking out of my work. Because we want to do what we want to do. And when you wonder why you're tired in the morning, it's because you're doing things you're not supposed to do, so your soul cannot rest in God. He says he is Jehovah Shalom. He is the Prince of Peace. He'll allow your, your, allow your head to lay down and to sleep when the whole world is in turmoil. You think Jonah was sleeping? He was laying down trying to make excuses for what was happening on the sea. So the captain came down to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Or What the heck are you doing? <laughs> Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. They already knew, because how many of you know? That person knows how to say when they ought to lie to you for you to know when they ought to lie. When you feel that the Spirit of God, they don't have to say a word, you know. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. Basically, we're going to figure out right now and cast lots. We're going to find out who is causing all of this to happen to us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, please tell us for what? For whose cause is this trouble upon us? Why is this happening to us? Right? What is your occupation? What do you do? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Jonah now, right? Jonah. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, why have you done this? Basically, they were telling him, you're such a fool. You serve the Lord, the God of all gods that told you to go to Nineveh. And you mean to tell us you jumped your body on our ship and now you're putting us in this mess? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord. If it ain't working out in your life, you better get back to the shadow of the Almighty. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more temp tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea and the sea will become calm for you. I know that this is great tempest, that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men ro rode hard to return to land, but they could not for the sea continued to grow more temp tempestuous against them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. They picked up Jonah and threw him in the sea, and the sea ceasing from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a big fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Because he left the presence of the Lord. He put other people's life in jeopardy. That's the reason why we have to be very careful of decisions that we make and doors that we open. Because it puts your children's children's life in jeopardy. You can choose to follow the instruction and be obedient like Abraham was and your seed seed can be blessed. Or you can remove yourself from the presence of the Lord and your seed seed be cursed. Because you removed yourself from the presence of the Lord. Church, there's so many doors that you can open in this world that we live in. I pray you made a decision and to know that Jesus is the way, the only way. He is the door. There is no other way. If you want to know how to be successful in 2024, you better know that Jesus is the only door. Doors are not always open physically. In this sense, doors are pathways we take. Some pathways may... We take, go against the will of God for our lives, just like what Jonah did. He rebelled against God's instruction. He did opposite of what God was telling him to do. Every door presented has something to offer you and I in this life we live. Every door offers you and I something. What is it that causes or stops us from opening doors that God has for us? What is stopping us from 
knowing that God is the only door? What is stopping us? I'd like to encourage you this with this last keys as we get ready to end our service this morning. This morning, if you heard the word and you felt the word is for you because I know you came in here wanting to hear from God, not from anybody else, but from God. I'd like to encourage you this morning on something that seems so hard to me in growing in my faith. But I've come as an adult, as a mom, as a pastor, as a grandmother, to now know that this is the very key to everything we do. The number one thing I'd like to say as you're looking at this, what, what's causing us to, to, to not walk in and accept God as the door, what's causing us to just go to any door, we got to check our hearts. Amen. The first door you want to look into this morning is check your heart. The Bible says, let a man examine himself. Are we yearning for righteousness in our lives? Because if we are, we yearn for the things of God. We yearn for the things of the Spirit of God. Are we yearning for righteousness in our lives? Have we made a decision to deaden our flesh, to kill the flesh, to kill our desires, to kill the things that our flesh wants to do? And let me tell you, you keep feeding your flesh. Your flesh will always arrive over your, arise over your spirit man. But every time you walk through that door, you're making a decision to feed your spirit man. Are you killing your flesh? Are you killing that personal desire? Are you killing that curiosity, that, that rebellion? And your emotional will? Romans 12, 1 and 2 in the Message Bible, it says this, and I brought it up last week if you were in our one service last week. In the Message Bible, it says it this way. So here's, Romans 12, 1 and 2, here's what I want you to do. Take this instruction, church, from the Lord. Hear his voice this morning as he's sitting here. Here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life you're sleeping you're eating you're going to work and you're walking around life and place it before God as an offering yes even your jobs even your relationships at your jobs even you're walking around in your community your neighborhood in the grocery store Driving on the road where it can get heated nowadays, even those things. We were driving to a party last night and out of nowhere this car just cut us off. It took me by surprise because there was nobody in front of him. It was just me almost going to my cutoff and this car just cut me off. And we were all like, what in And my daughter in the back of me, what now? Blast the horn. I blast the heart a little bit. Because I, in my mind, I think, is this person okay or what? Because there's no reason to cut me off. See, even the times in traffic like that. <laughs> we got to lay those things down, church. Because you and I know we're living in treacherous yeah, times. Yeah. Yeah. Now, all they could have been waiting for, the devil wanted to do, was have me respond. And boom, you know what could possibly come out of that car. That's what the devil wants for you and I. His job is to steal, kill, and destroy. You know, coming out of my night, we think, like we said, uh, who can stop me now? That's, that's, that's our, our prideful attitude at times because we were, we were the toughest people on this island. So, so we used to like to say, that pride can kill you and I. We got to really... Give these things to God and offer it. What does the Bible say is in here? Place it before God as an offering. You don't got to be like that. You don't got to talk like that. You don't got to act that way. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Embracing what God can do for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. 
You cannot fit into it without even thinking. You gotta know who you are. You gotta know what your purpose is because easily God could have placed you there to pull the people out from there, but guess what? You fit in. Then he cannot use you to pull them out because what did you do? You began to fit in. Don't become one of just him. Fix your attention on God. You'll be, you'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Quickly, church. Quickly respond to what God wants for you, from you. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. You don't got to be like that. And lastly, show up. Check your heart. And number two, show up. Do you know that walking into the doors to church or walking in the doors to a Bible studies every week is what you need to kill your flesh? It's what you need to deaden your flesh? So if this is a necessity to killing your flesh, why do we sometimes pick and choose when we want to walk into these doors? Why does it become a, a choice? When you need clothes, you wash your clothes because you need clothes. Let me tell you this. You need God. You need God to lead you. You need God to guide you. Why aren't you making that same decision like you make every day to wash your clothes? Why isn't that a priority to walk into the house of God and say, I got to kill my flesh today? Why isn't that a priority? Why do we pick and choose when? To open these doors here, and I'm talking about here a couple of middle school. To open these doors so that the word of God can be ministered to every Sunday comes with a cost. It's not free. It's not free. And before, I think you could rent this cafeteria. Well, I know at my night, we could rent the cafeteria for less than a hundred bucks. Well, long are the days that it's, been, it's in the hundreds. Long, far gone are those days. It comes with a cost. The lease needs to be paid so that this door can be open for X amount of time so that we can be spiritually encouraged. Why are we not taking advantage of a spiritual lifeline to keep you and I Killing our flesh and out of the hands of the enemy. We got to see this priority. We got to make this a priority. No matter what, God, I'm going to make this a priority. No matter how I'm feeling, no matter if we just fought in a car with my husband, no matter how irritated I am looking at my kids, God, this is a necessity for my life. I've come to learn that people that's on dialysis, if they don't go to the dialysis, they can possibly not wake up the next day. It's a necessity that they need for them to live. You got to see God as a necessity in your life. You cannot pick and choose when you want to be here. Deaconess Kat came up earlier. She did the offering. She said, God doesn't need our money. True, he doesn't need our money. We need him. And everybody get turned off when it comes to money. But you were so quick to buy those Maoli tickets. And Maoli ain't taking you to heaven. Oh, Luke Bryant's coming down next month. We gotta get on there and get our tickets. And when they're asking for offering, you go like this. Oh, here we go again at church asking for, well, huh? do you want to sit without seating fans? We already know my air condition. These places is because people like you and I, we need God. He don't need us. We need Him. I need God to keep this place open. I need God to keep our main house open. Why, God? Because you know the things I'm going through and you know when I want to drop by that altar. I am grateful that there's an altar I can drop in front of. And when my man of God do what he did last week, he said, we're going to anoint everybody in this house. God, thank you that we could all stand up and walk into the house of God and he can anoint us. Because I cannot imagine how people live in their own homes not having their man of God anoint them. It's meaningful to me. It's symbolic to me to know that my man of God, my lifeline. I'm not, 
idolizing the man. I'm saying, God, thank you that you spoke to this man to break down things for me so my family and I can stand victorious in this day that we live. That's the reason why we have a man and woman of God for you and I to lead us. Don't let the devil lie to you. Or they only like our money, their church only. If God's people wanted your money, Chick-fil-A be open on Sundays. That's but let me tell you this. They knew the key. They went like this. God gave us, gave us the opportunity to have this business. We're going to put God first. Sundays, we can close. And God will always make up for what we could have made on Sunday. So that the good old store closed. I, I admire that. So I told my husband, he said, got to get to Chick-fil-A this morning and have breakfast over there. It's tomorrow, it's closed. In COVID, when the doors is closed, the people will sing this. When are you going to open the church doors? Because they realized the one place was open every Sunday was not closed to them. Now that the church is open, where are they? My kids get football today. Your kids will never know who Jesus is and how he should be the head if you keep letting them play sports on Sunday that belongs to God. That's the reason why kids don't know that God should be first in their life. I have kids. My kids play sports. I understand. Totally understand. We try every way to, to ask the people, you guys can make a league on Saturday. Can you guys go back to make a league for us on Saturday? They're looking at us like, oh, what, what, who are you guys special? <laughs> no, but I bet you if you need an answer, you know that Jesus is first. You know that he is the only way. We gotta stop making excuses. The only way we're gonna get the people back to knowing who is the only way is if you and I make a stand. We gotta make a stand. This year, I pray you make every attempt to walk into those doors. Yes. Wanting to walk into the doors and actually walking in is what causes, is causing many of us to live victoriously. Congratulations, first Sunday of the year you walked in. Because you said, I gotta live victoriously. Or we could have stayed home and said, we don't mind living with challenges every day of our lives. We find ourselves in a slump spiritually. And we then, we stay away from the fellowship. We disconnect ourselves from our spiritual lifeline. Church, I do want to encourage you. Staying away from church will keep you feeling depressed. Keep you in arguments, keeping you defeated. Do not find yourself in isolation. Isolation is the devil's playground. Stop saying, I connected, I watch them on TV. No, 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 no. I, I watch you guys on social media. No, no. There's a reason why the Bible says neglect not the assemblies of the saints. We do. We have it on social media. People, people watching right now. You know, we do, we do, we have those things. But if they ain't gonna walk in yet, to know that it's important to neglect not the Sundays of the saints. We gotta find a way to get in there somehow. But you and I know you don't ever pay attention at home as much as you pay attention while sitting in here. Because at home you can walk to the icebox and make you something to eat, grab something to drink, sit down and go like this. What she said? But in here you stand up and walk and everybody looking at you. Because only get 50 of us in here. For now. For now. Amen. We got to get out there. We got to get them back, guys. We got to let them know this is the answer. Jesus is the way. It's not Ark of Safety is not the way. Jesus is the way. I pray you're blessed this morning. Some new changes we're doing in this church because you know what? God got to move. He has to have his being. He has to have his direction. Some new things we're going to be introducing as a ministry here. One of the things that I do want to say that we are going to introduce shortly. It's called something. It's called the circle. Accountability. Because how many of you know that we need accountability in our lives? Many different churches has what's called connect groups. We have groundbreakers, Bible studies. But not like, not like having just 12 close friends that say, hey, how are you doing today? 
People that you can pour your heart, heart out into and they can encourage you the right way. The right way. You ever share your heart with somebody that is not lined up with God? Let me tell you. The husband gonna know when they get home. The kids gonna know. The neighbor gonna know. The auntie gonna know. Everybody's gonna know your business. But you have the right people around you. This is what they do, sister. I don't need to hear anymore. I'm coming in agreement with you. I'm gonna take this to the throne room of God. Men, as much as you don't want to be accountable to each other, you don't want nobody telling you what to do, right? I don't want to tell you what to do. We need accountability. Are you raising up the next generation to be mighty men of God? Because this is what that could do. It's all about duplication. I want to make sure my kids know how to stand firm upon God just as much as me. Because mom's not going to be here for the rest of their lives. I want to make sure and know that they know enough about Jesus and they have enough people around them to teach them the way. I don't want them to go through everything I went through, every heartache, every brokenness in my life to know who Jesus is. Mom went through it so you don't have to experience, but I got to let you know why I love Jesus. And wrapping up today, I do want to say God is the door. He is the door in 2024. Don't let the enemy lead you into Rebellion, curiosity. Stay in obedience of God and follow his instructions so that your seed, seed may be blessed. Amen, church.
for joining us here at Ark of Safety Christian Fellowship. Remember, if you're giving your tithes and offering, you can visit us at aoshawaii.com or text the word GIVE to 1-808-518-3793. God bless.